Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. Thank you for being here with us today. If you're a guest, my name is Joe Lachlan. I'm the lead pastor here, and I would love to meet you this morning before you leave. Val, my wife, and I will be out in the commons after the service. Come by, say hello, and introduce yourself. We'd appreciate that. We want to welcome those who are watching by live stream as well. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Wherever you are, maybe you're a church member traveling. We even have some folks overseas right now. Uh, maybe uh, you're a first-time viewer of our live stream. We want to say thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. We really, really appreciate it. We are excited that we have three viable venues here at First Temple. We have the classic venue right now, right across the hall. At the same time, we have the modern venue going on, and we have the live stream venue at 930 and 11, and they are not our smallest venue. So uh, we really appreciate uh, everyone who's here and watching online this morning. Now, we've seemed to be in a mode of singing this morning. I've listened to you sing. I wonder if you would help me sing this morning. Would you do that? You're going to recognize a song I'm going to start, and uh, then you'll join me on the chorus. And for you musicians in the room, I uh, shudder to think what key you're going to discover I might start this song in. I I just pick a note and go, and uh, it could be five sharps and make you wince. I have no idea, but uh, you hang in there with me, all right? There's a reason I want us to sing this. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Hey, y'all did great. That was good. Give yourselves a hand. Can you do that? That was good. Even, even heard some harmony over here. That was awesome. Love those songs. Love the one Sydney sang a minute ago. Senior at Mayor Harden Baylor. Way to go, Sydney. That was awesome. Beautiful. It was great. Yeah. Sometimes our songs really speak about great stuff with God. But sometimes our songs... Like the one we just sang with together, you with me, the sweet by and by, there, there's a little bit that we, is left out because it's all about that which is going to be in the hereafter and the sweet by and by and how wonderful that is. And we look forward to that. The catch is, though, is that the gospel Jesus came to bring and introduced and made available to you and me is a gospel that is about more than just the hereafter. It's about the here and now. Listen to his words. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Available now, says Dallas Willard. It's about the here and now. Remember the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. We studied last month. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, when he came to the earth, God in the flesh, when he died on the cross, when he was buried in the tomb, when he raised from the grave, made available to us the kingdom of God, the kingdom that had always existed, is now available to humanity, available to you and me. We have access to the kingdom of God that will last forever, but Jesus introduced for the here and now. As Paul says, we may still look through a glass dimly and that we can't see everything or experience everything to the full extent we will someday in the sweet by and by. But we can begin to experience the wonderful blessings of the kingdom of God, the ways of God, and the economy of God even now. When I say economy, what I mean is that thing that the parables are teaching us. We've decided that for this month and a couple of weeks in August, we'll look at some of the parables Jesus taught to introduce to us the ways of the kingdom of God. That's what the parables are for. That's what the stories of the kingdom are about. They help us understand the economy of the kingdom. Now, the economy of the kingdom of God is completely inverted 
It's things like the first shall be last. And if you want to be served, you have to serve. And if you want to live, you have to die to your old way of living, die to self. It's an inverted kind of economy. The, the parable we're going to see this morning is about the economy of God and how it is unique and distinct from any other economy on the planet. The parables also help us identify what is valuable, what is not, what is to be celebrated, what is to be put in its place. And a reminder that the parables are not intended as some of the things Jesus taught and some of the things Jesus did to comfort the afflicted. Instead, just the inverse, the parables, the stories are designed to afflict the comfortable, to get us out of our little comfort zones. Those things that just make us feel good and happy. The parables are designed to kind of goad us out of that because those things that are being met and satisfied in our comfort zones are things that actually do not even fit in the kingdom of God. In the parables, we see the economy of God involves the high value of relationships, family and friends, of course, but also strangers and, and even even enemies, the high value placed on relationships of even those whom we would count as our nemeses, those people that really kind of get under our skin, just kind of rub our fur backwards. The kingdom of God raises up the value of even those relationships. And finally, the value of generosity and interdependence in community. That is something that is so foreign from the economy of our culture today. Yet the kingdom of God is all about what we can experience together in the community of God. These ideas about the parables and kingdoms, the team and I, the teaching team and I have discovered in a book called Short Stories by Jesus, written by a a wonderful theologian, Amy Jill Levine. She's an expert on the Jewish Jesus, and this is what she says about these parables. Jesus wants us to be better than we are because with his work happening in us, we have the potential to be better than we are. He knows we are made a little lower than the angels, so we should observe ourselves acting and behaving in a more heavenly manner. Because we are citizens of the kingdom, we've been given access to it and have available to us the power of it, the transforming work of it inside us, we should begin to see ourselves acting more and more like we belong in the kingdom rather than belong in this world. Old-fashioned preachers would say it this way. There should be a distinct difference, noticeable, visible, observable, experiential difference between those who are followers of Jesus Christ and those who are not. The ways of the kingdom becoming our ways. So let's look at one of these stories in Matthew chapter 20. Open up a copy of God's Word. Look with me on the church app or open up your favorite Bible app on your phone. And look with me in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20. Jesus is speaking a parable. It's called the laborers in the vineyard. Now remember, there are some things in this parable that are going to make us uncomfortable. And I want to remind you that the nature of the parables is not to identify a particular overarching uh, moral or lesson for the entire parable for everyone to apply in their life. But there are things in this parable that maybe make you uncomfortable, that don't make me uncomfortable, make me uncomfortable, don't make you uncomfortable. And there are observations that you're going to have, I'm not going to have. And that's the design. It's very personal in nature as Jesus told these stories. In fact, I wonder if you might even find yourself in this story. You might identify where you would be in this story. Matthew chapter 20. Did that give you long enough to find it? Did that do that right there? Okay, all right, cool. All right. Jesus taught, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers in the vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, 
denarius is about a day's wage. It would pay for a family to feed, eat for about three days. When he agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. He went out about nine o'clock and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those, he said, you go into the vineyard also, and whatever is right, I will give you at the end of the day. And so they went. Again, he went out about noon and then about three in the afternoon and did the same thing again and again. And then about five in the afternoon, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. So he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Now, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour or five in the afternoon with one hour left to work came, each one received a full day's wage. So when those hired first came to get paid, they thought they would receive even more. But each of them also received a full day's wage. When they received it and asked, what? They grumbled at the, grumbled at the landowner, saying, those who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day's work and the scorching heat. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius, a day's wage? Take what is yours and go. But I want to give to this last person the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do with what I want with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. I mean, maybe maybe one of the first thoughts you and I would have, that is no way to run a business. Ain't nobody going to show up the next day till about five in the afternoon to go to work, right? Yeah. So I don't know if you know this about reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures. Context is always vitally important, especially that which comes right before something. And I want to invite you into the context of this story, why Jesus told this story, when he told it, where he told it, to whom he told it. And that's found at the end of Matthew chapter 19. So at the end of Matthew chapter 19, Jesus has just been speaking with a guy who's known as the rich young ruler. And he has discovered by talking to Jesus that he, his wealth does not get him into the kingdom. In fact, <laughs> the currency he has in his wealth doesn't exchange and transfer into the economy of the kingdom. It's no good there. And so he's got to figure out how in the world to leave it behind. And he's not sure he wants to do that. So he went away sad. So Jesus tells his disciples in verse 23 of chapter 19, Truly I say to you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, uh, then who can be saved? And Jesus, looking at them, said, well, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Hang on to that verse. We're going to come back to it. Verse 27, Peter has an answer or a question. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you found yourself in the story already. I always find myself in Peter's sandals. I don't know. I, God uses Peter a lot with his mouth to get good stuff done. But 100% of the time, Peter gets himself in trouble. It's how? It, how is it about? It's with his mouth, right? Absolutely. Okay? That's how I get myself in trouble, like I just did. All right? So, yeah, that's how I get myself in trouble is with my mouth. Peter here, I mean, Jesus has just said this astonishing thing and this incredible thing that ought to cause everyone to just sit there and go, I'm going to have to think on that for a little bit. With people, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Hmm. I mean, like you, crickets, right? Nothing, you, I mean, nobody has a thing that could be said except for, of course, Peter. Yeah. Then Peter responded and said to him, behold, I just love that. He tells Jesus, behold, come on, Peter, dude, come on, man. You're killing me, Smalls. All right, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? All right, we're in on the ground floor here, Jesus. What are we going to get out of the deal? Okay. 
Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Cool. But verse 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. Because many who are first will be last and the last first. And oh, Peter, by the way, I got a story for you. So the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. See, the context helps us. Jesus told this story in response to this question of Peter. Hey, we're in on the ground floor. We started with you first thing. These other people that have come later, okay, they're going to get their reward. But what's in it for us? Because we were like the early adopters, Jesus. So we're on the ground floor. What? What do we get out of the deal? And Jesus says, well, it's going to be cool. You're going to have thrones to sit on. But in the kingdom, guess what? Thrones aren't that big of a deal. In fact, everyone is going to be rewarded. And some of the things everyone get are going to even be greater, much more valuable than sitting on a throne. Because the earthly terms, being on a throne and being able to rule and reign over something or, you know, kind of be in charge of some area of heaven or whatever would sound kind of cool. But in the kingdom of heaven, that's, that's going to be nothing compared to what I, I mean. Look at verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. The throne thing's not all that big a deal. So he tells this story. Would you read it with me again? Maybe find your place in this story again. Maybe you're an employer who has workers that you have to pay. And you're thinking, well, this is no way to run my business. I'm not going to start doing it this way. Maybe an employee who works with people who are kind of, you know, (laughs) kind of idling through the day. And they end up getting the same hourly wage you do. And you're like, this is not fair. And you're right, it's not. In the earthly economy. What's it mean in the kingdom economy? Read with me again, all right? Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a full day's wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about the 9 o'clock in the morning, some others standing out on the marketplace. And those, he said, you go into the vineyard also, and whatever is right for working from 9 in the morning on, I'll, I'll, I'll give you. And so they went. And again, He went out about noon and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, did the same thing. Then about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, because no one has hired us yet. And he said, liar, liar, pants on fire, because I was here four other times earlier in the day, and you were standing here, and I went to hire you, and you didn't do anything. Oh, wait, that's not what he said, but that's what he could have said, okay? That's what he could have said. Verse 7, he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. What? Yeah, you go into the vineyard too. Now, when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group of the first. When those hired about five o'clock in the afternoon, one, one hour of work, each one received a full day's wage. And so when those hired first came, they thought for sure they'd be getting the full day's wage plus some more. But each of them received what they had agreed to, a full day's wage. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, those who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. You you have made them equal to us. You have given them the same status. You have given them equal to us. We've been here from the very beginning of this thing, and you you made them, does it sound like Peter? I think it sounds like Peter. You have made them equal to us who who have borne the burden of the day's work and the scorching heat. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a day's wage? Take what is yours and go, but I I want to give to this last person the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with, with what is my own? It is my kingdom, after all. It is my vineyard, after all. Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. I have some observations. Again, these are mine. I don't know if they help you kind of generate your own. Or if you'll identify with these, or if you, it might spur some ideas that you have your own observations about this particular story. But I'm going to share with you what mine are. First observation is this. The economy of this kingdom is different from any other economy on the planet. 
This would not make sense in capitalism. It would not make sense in socialism. It would not place, it make sense in feudalism or communism or any other man-made kind of idea about how to run the economy. It just wouldn't work. It wouldn't compute. It wouldn't balance out the books. This economy is unique to the kingdom of God, and it is inverted. Second observation, those who get in on the ground floor are treated fairly, but they are not given special status or reward. Thrones, medals, trophies, special labels, titles might seem a good thing or special reward or status in the earthly mindset, but they don't mean anything in the kingdom of God except for the one throne. And that is the one thing, another observation I share with you that I've shared with you since I was your interim pastor in 2012 and 2013. In the kingdom of God, there are only two ranks. There's king and not king. And the king is Jesus and everybody else is, say it with me, not king. That's right. Now, in this story, there's a third person. There's the landowner, and there are the workers, but there's a manager. And some have said, and I think it's probably right how Jesus was telling the story, that God the Father is the landowner. He is the kingdom owner, and the manager of it, the one who doles out all the rewards, is the manager. That's Jesus himself. And then the rest of us are all in the vineyard. The community standards of this kingdom mean that we celebrate when God provides for anyone, even those who don't deserve to be provided for. The reason is, is because we realize that being in this kingdom at all, being invited into this vineyard, is an act of God's grace, not merit. Even those who are in the marketplace at the very early of the morning when he came to hire they were going nowhere that's what the word idle means in verse 3 and verse 6 they were going nowhere just like when Jesus walked up on Peter and the others who were fishermen and they were doing really in terms of the kingdoms of God's economy going nowhere and God invited them into the kingdom and gave them a direction and a destination to go We recognize that we are in the kingdom of God. We are invited into the vineyard, if you will, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, never the merit. If you look back in verse chapter 19, verse 26, we are reminded about this. Verse 25, the disciples then said, well, who then can be saved? It's not only not possible for a rich man to be saved the way Jesus described it, it's not possible for any human to be saved into the kingdom of God. But verse 26, Jesus said, ah, yes, that's right. With people, with humans, it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. One of the sticking points of this story, one of the barbs in it, I think, for those of us who've been in church any length of time at all, is that somehow, some way, we've gotten the idea that it didn't take as much of God's grace to save us as it does some other people. We have people in our circles where we go, that's going to take a lot to save that person. In fact, there are some we might say that there, there's no way that person will ever be saved. When we have forgotten that it is not possible for any of us to be saved except for the grace of God. Sometimes I think there's even a mentality for those of us who have been in church all our lives and maybe even nine months before we were born. We, we somehow think we've got kind of in on the ground floor of this thing and we think, well, you know what, we've been, I've been at this from the beginning and so, you know, I, these guys that come in later, or maybe you've been a member of First Baptist Church Temple for like decades and you're seeing all these new people coming and you're going, well, yeah, okay, well, that's cool, but you know what, I've been here a long time. I mean, I've been, I, hey, you know, I've, I, hey, I've been here a long time. I've been here a long time. As if maybe some, there's some special status or rank or something in, in the body of Christ or in the kingdom of God or even at First Temple, and there's not. Because there's Jesus and the rest of us all in the same playing field. 
I mean, sometimes I think we think about this as if we've gotten in on the ground floor, and really it's, it's Peter and, and James and John and these guys who walked with Jesus at the very beginning who were on the ground floor, and even they are not even going to get special reward or special status or special treatment any more than anybody else. And those of us who know Christ now, centuries later are nothing more than Johnny-come-latelys in reality. And without Christ, we were all idle. We were all headed nowhere. And yet God saw fit to invite us into the kingdom. There's one more observation about this story that I've saved for the last because it will be the most unpopular thing I say, maybe in this series, not just this sermon. So I'm thinking it'd be good to say it at the last and pray and run while everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Did you pick up on this? The, 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 the kingdom of, of heaven, if it's like this vineyard, is a kingdom of work. It's a kingdom of work. Preach, you mean to tell me that in the sweet by and by I'm going to be working? I'm planning on like doing even less than I'm doing right now. Well, I'm retired. What are you talking about? Well, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers in his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a day's work, he sent them into the vineyard. I can only assume he sent them into the vineyard to work. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of work. Now, I want to remind you that even before the fall in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were created in order to do what? To, to work the ground. To harvest. It was only after the fall that the work became toil and labor but humans were created for work. And in the kingdom of God, in the economy of God, we are still going to be called to a kingdom of work. And maybe it makes you feel better to use a different word for work, like serve. And that feels a little better. But whether we're going to do work in the sweet by and by, in the hereafter, right now, in the here and now, we are definitely called to a kingdom of work and serving God and partnering with him in the work of God and the work of the kingdom. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. You've got 8 and 9 down probably by memory, but verse 10 we often ignore or forget to read into. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, you've been invited into the vineyard by grace. That it's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved for works, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in Team and I are working on a new series called Everybody Counts, and you're going to see in that series uh, in August and September that uh, there is a sermon about the idea that there is something, a part to play, a role to fill, a service to serve for each and every member of the body of Christ because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of work. I wonder what the Spirit of God has pointed out, maybe with a pokey finger out in your heart today. I wonder what levels of comfort he has disturbed as we've read this story. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and take 60 seconds to listen to the voice of God about the takeaway he wants for you in this text. <laughs> 